there. Oh, it's coverage. It's and what does that mean? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, uh, welcome everybody, and uh, thank you for coming at this uh, special time. Uh, and um, it's a pleasure for me uh, to welcome and introduce uh, uh, Professor Giorgio from University of Minnesota. He got a, his a diploma from uh, in mechanical and electrical engineering from uh, the National Technical University uh, in Athens, Greece and his PhD degree from University of Florida in 1983. Uh, he has one of these sort of, uh, uh, I, w I should say, w w uh, not unique, but rare uh, uh, thing of being uh, a former student of Kalman, mm. with whatever that carries. <laughs> 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 and uh, so, uh, and he's currently a professor uh, of electrical engineer and uh, holds uh, the Vincentine Hermes Lu uh, chair. And uh, he's also the co-director for the Control Science and Dynamical Systems Center at uh, Minnesota. Uh, he's extremely well known in uh, the area of controls uh, and uh, systems in general, information theory and applied mathematics. Uh, he is uh, a three-peat recipient of the George Axelby Outstanding Paper Award in the Control Systems uh, Society. He's a fellow of IEEE, of course, and a former member of the Royal S Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to uh, welcome you, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hamid, very much. It's a great pleasure being here, especially in view of the fact that in Minnesota the, the temperature is minus 15 right now. <laughs> So <coughs> what I will, <coughs> I will talk to you about is uh, um, a, uh, some exploration in, in, uh, in certain geometric ideas that are relevant in statistical estimation, even image analysis, and power spectral analysis. That's where I started from looking into this. And, and it's relevant in tracking detection, uh, estimation, and so forth. Uh, there are several people that have contributed in various parts of this, uh, this uh, journey here. Some former students of mine, some uh, colleagues, Alan Tannenbaum and his uh, uh, late son, Emmanuel. And um, so the first slide here is sort of very general pictorial of showing that uh, uh, the, the context is signal images and information. How do you extract information from signals? Uh, I'll focus more on spectral analysis, but some of the ideas permeate uh, in a wider sort of range of things, and you'll see some of that. So in everything that we do as engineers, we require metrics. Like uh, we quantify uncertainty, distances between dynamical models. And uh, this is how kind of uh, my sort of train of, of thinking developed. Like in, in when you quantify distance between signals, we have well-defined distance measures between points, trajectories. In systems, again, I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this in the context of robust analysis and control operator norms and gains, when you talk about uh, densities and probability distributions, masses, and so forth, uh, a, a different kind of uh, metrics are relevant. Of course, you can use some of this, but you need some things that have some interpretation. So I would like to, to begin, uh, first of all, motivating a little bit of how you can develop metrics that have uh, significance and relevance. So. And I'll start with uh, this, this power spectral content uh, context. So power spectra have been with us for a long time. And uh, I don't need to um, advertise this in this audience. So signals are represented by a power, uh, power spectrum, which represents power distribution at different frequencies uh, through suitable representation of time series. So, um, and they are used everywhere in all our cell phones, radar, medical diagnostics, and so forth. This is just as a, a schematic, some application we played with, uh, with a colleague at Minnesota in non-invasive temperature sensing. And this thing goes on and on in terms of applications, I, again. Um, so the, what is the point here? The point is that uh, we replace time signals with power distributions, and we'd like to get sort of a distance measure between power distributions. 
uh, the difference between those is not a signal, and uh, there are um, there is a natural question of what are suitable notions of distance, which you can use for a variety of purposes: classification, detect structural changes, and so forth. And to be fair, there have been a number of of ideas, um, uh, you know, throughout in in, in uh, signal analysis, Itakura site of distance, kullback libler and we'll see some of this. Okay. But um, I would like, and this is the plan of the talk, I'd like to sort of pose this question on the table of, of what are natural metrics um, in, in signal analysis, in, in spectral analysis, people talk about distance measures, They're not metrics necessarily, and they motivate those in terms of their perceptive qualities and other th uh, things. Uh, kullback libre is much more natural in the context of information theory, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, in the context of spectra, it, it's interesting to pose this question and say, you know, how do you devise metrics? And this uh, apply in a more general setting, and we'll see a lot of connections. So initially, I'll talk about recipes, or why do you need the metrics for? You need to uh, quantify some performance. Uh, I'll draw some parallels with information geometry and um, uh, the, the, the geometry of the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the Fisher metric, and then talk about another subject, which is very, very popular these days, Monch Cantor of the Optimal Transport, and, and there are very tight connections between all this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about relevance and application. I'll move very fast here, because there's a lot more material for matrix value generalizations of this. Uh, and there are several connections, even with uh, geometry of uh, quantum information, that I would like to touch upon. So the beginning is some sort of a model for developing metrics. You have two time series. Here they are, and here is their spectral uh, power spectral distributions, and you want a distance between them. What is a natural notion of distance? As I said, there are lots of distance measures. Some of them work very well. Itakura Saito is, is a celebrated measure, and it actually does connect with some of the things we'll talk about. People t uh, typically uh, build this on complex functionals that have some nice qualities. Uh, we're going to do something slightly different, different. The question is, why do you need a metric? Uh, typically, one is interested in one step ahead prediction, a very classical problem with more than half a century of, of history. And there you have the present value of the time series. You want to de determine this based on the past. And the simplest thing to do, linear combinations of past values. And you'd like to minimize the variance of the prediction error. This is an old subject going back to the foundations of uh, complex analysis with uh, Zigo's formula. And it turns out the least variance turns out to be the geometric mean of the power spectral density. I think some of you have seen this formula. Those of you that have not or are not familiar with this, it's a very beautiful formula. The least variance, the best you can do if you know the power spectral density, F, is, is this. That's the variance, the best you can do. That's a, 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 the geometric mean, a continuous version of that. So I have over here a, a, a little thing that will help you uh, it's a mnemonic thing to just kind of remember what this means. The cubic root of a product of three values is the exp of the average of the logarithms. So that's the continuous version of that. And there are reasons why it should be like this. A and, and some interesting questions that I can discuss later with private for multivariable generalizations. <coughs> so what do you want to take into account when you have two time series is the distance between them as it pertains to your ability to predict. So here is a certain theme that I propose that can be applied in other contexts as well. So you use information about, you have two time series, you don't know which one it is, the one that you're observing. So you have two power spectral densities. If it was the, the red time series, then you would use the information in the power spectrum of of this particular time series to design a, an estimator. But let's say nature plays a trick on you and generates the data out of the blue time series. So the degradation of predictive error variance is this thing. <coughs> the, 
You try to predict the blue time series based on coefficients you computed on the wrong assumption. So this is the degraded variance, and you compare it to the optimal variance. It makes sense. And it makes sense to try to build geometry out of, of this performance degradation. Interestingly, if you look at the degraded variance of the optimal variance, optimal variance is the same thing where the A here is a blue. In other words, you compute it based on the correct assumption. So this quantity turns out to be the arithmetic mean over the geometric mean of the, the two power spectra. It's the, this quantity over that. And um, you can play a little bit more with that and, and try to see what happens if the two are nearby. If the, uh, the red power spectrum is very close to the blue one, uh, module a little bit some perturbation here, this quantity becomes a quadratic expression. In other words, it, it is a Riemannian metric on the, on the, uh, the space of spectral densities. And it has a variance looking type of quantity. It looks like delta square over f square. And there is a correction factor here. So this is, is really a metric. It's a Riemannian metric. Uh, and when you have a Riemannian metric, you can compute a lot of things. You can compute distances between points. You can compute geodesics between two points. So. Uh, you can, in fact, talk about the geodesics, right? You want to go from one power spectrum to the other and have the whole path that minimizes that uh, geodesic distance. And this is easy to, to do. Um, the F1s that you're talking about, uh, are they, uh, they're not density functions. They're just power spectra. Power spectra. Okay. They're, they're not densities. No, they're not density. Okay. They're power spectral densities. Okay. So for power spectra, uh, the, 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 the claim is that this is a natural metric because it quantifies the degradation of um, um, predictive error variance. Right. Okay. And, and you can build a whole of ge uh, geometry out of this. Uh, the geodesics turn out to be uh, logarithmic intervals. So if you start from F0 and you want to go to F1, this is the formula that gives this. And uh, so if here is one power spectrum and here is the other, and then you can consider the deformation from one to the other, um, the distance between the, the two, the, the geodesic distance, the path length, interestingly, takes this form. This is a scale invariance, the shape uh, recognizer. It's what is actually has been used in signal analysis, and it's called uh, uh, the logarithmic, logarithmic distance. I mean, typically, uh, all of us engineers, we, we try to li we like, and we saw some things earlier in our discussion, that taking the logarithm is a good thing. A and this thing here is just the L2 distance on the logarithms. It's not new. This has been used forever. But this is an explanation of why this is natural. It is actually a geodesic distance of something that is quite meaningful. So pressing on, I would like to discuss a little bit uh, a subject called information geometry. This has, uh, this is, uh, this has a 60, 70 year history. Go goes back to uh, the work of Rao and uh, uh, Fisher, and more recently you know, became a subject by Amari in, 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 in a very sort of uh, uh, deep and, and essential way. I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the, the latest things. I'm going to go back to the early history. Again, it started with uh, Fisher. Rao recognized a uh, certain significance of, of, um, of metrizing probability spaces. And then uh, kullback libler uh, in the context of uh, um, hypothesis testing, or here I'm motivating a little bit different, introduce the kullback libler distance, which is very, very relevant and very analogous to what we talked before. Yes? I had a question on the previous part about the, the log, the l distance. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, F1 and F0 are power spectra, right? Yes. But uh, 
So this thing acting as a geodesic, is it also on the whole space of L2 functions? Sorry? Or does this act as a geodesic on all space of continuous functions or is there specific properties of uh, power spectra which makes this distance a geodesic on that? So can we use this? Uh, as long as these quantities here are, are uh, L2, things are fine. You can, you can you know, you can use it as a metric in this in this space, yes. But it has a meaning in the context of, it's a metric that has a meaning. But the spectral densities are basically positive, uh, you know, the non-negative. Right, uh, right. Yeah. I, was, I was just thinking, was it very specific to spectral spectra, or can you use well, it? Well, it's specific in the sense. Uh, the meaning uh, is specific. Uh, I mean, this, this mentioned, uh, Professor Kim just mentioned that you, you need to be able to take logarithms, so it's positive. And again, there are there are a little bit of restrictions in terms of w in, in like what happens if these are uh, non-deterministic uh, or deterministic uh, spectral deterministic processes. I'm not going into more technicalities, but I this is sort of a, a, a scheme that you can generate metrics that have significance. So let's go very quickly here. Actually, I have a, quite a lot of material, so I'll, I'll, I'll move fast. So. Uh, in information geometry, again, the whole idea starts with saying, like, suppose you have two probability distributions, right? How far apart are they? So initially, the whole idea uh, revolved around discriminating. You have a fair coin and a fake coin. One is 50-50 heads and tails. The other is 70-30. Uh, and the ability to discriminate by exper experiment using some Bayesian formalism of, of assessing probabilities of whether it's this one or that one revolves around the kullback libler uh, distance between the two probability distributions. And another, I'm not going to explain this. This is sort of fairly standard. And this is also standard. But I would, li I would like to stick a little bit to, to this motivation for a metric. And this is called the Fisher metric. So you have two probability distributions. Instead of f that we had before, now we have p's. So the p's are the, uh, the uh, blue p and the red p. And you would like to understand uh, the degradation of coding efficiency if you try to encode uh, a, a, a message that's generated by a um, a, um, a source that is for sort of generating symbols according to one distribution, but you use the wrong assumption as to which one it is. So, uh, and, and the degradation is quantified by the kullback libler distance. So this is the entropy of your source. So this is the average message length, expected message length. And this would be uh, the one that you would get if, if you have made the wrong uh, assumption in the blue series as opposed to the, the red uh, sequence of, of characters coming t towards you. So that is very much the same like we had before as a degradation of predictive error variance. Now this is degradation of error, a, a message length increase. In the small, when the two, uh, you can think of this as probability vectors. Uh, the generalization to continuum is also uh, straightforward. But so then the, the, the kullback libre distance between p plus delta to p becomes the, the so-called Fisher information metric. This is, this is again, very, very related. In fact, identical to what is called, and I have it here on the side, uh, the Fisher information matrix. The Fisher information matrix is an expression of this type, which is a quadratic form. Um, again, um, relates exactly to this. Uh, there is a, it has the form of delta square over p. So, and it is a Riemannian metric. Uh, a lot is known about that. So for instance, here's an example just to give you a little bit of intuition. If you look at probability vectors with three entries, these are uh, positive values that sum up to 1. So the, the space is this simplex. And um, uh, you can quantify distance between two points using this Riemannian metric, the Fisher information metric. So if they are close, 
the, the distance is the sum of the squares divided that, but, but, that, but the, by the p that you are sitting at. Okay, that's a, an honest Riemannian metric. A lot is known, as I said, uh, to construct geodesics. There is this transformation that takes p uh, from the simplex to the sphere, because you see the sum of the p's sum up to 1, the sum of the squares of the square root sum up to 1. So this is, you're looking on the sphere. Geodesics translate into great circles, it turns out. And the geodesic distance is, is nothing more than the angle between two points when you're projecting them up on the sphere. And this is the, some, you can take arc length or whatever, the, the Bhattacharya distance relates very much to that. And there is a, tr a, a very nice analog with what we talked before and what we're talking now. Uh, the Riemannian metric, Fisher's metric is this on power spectral densities if you care about prediction. This is a natural metric. Um, this transformation here and this transformation there uh, map uh, the, the space into, embed the space into Euclidean space where you can nicely characterize um, ge geodesics. Here there are uh, circles, here are logarithmic families, and distances uh, can get close form expressions. Uh, between the distributions, probability, or, or spectral distributions. So, so this, this draws a little bit of some analogy, but uh, there is more to it. Um, there are more things that, by the way, let me just go back to the previous slide. Uh, this, this, um, this template of creating metrics can be extended to other things. Like suppose, for example, you're not interested in prediction, you're inter interested in smoothing. You can do verbatim the same thing. You create a different metric, different geodesics, etc. Some of them are more difficult to compute. For for smoothing, you can do, uh, you can get uh, expressions, but you can you can talk about other things. You, you, what is it you want the metric for? The moment this is clear to you, then you look at degradation of your performance, and voila, you know, and you carry it to the natural logical conclusion. So, but sometimes you need more. And uh, information geometry has a, a, some, there's a sequel to, to this early work, which is encapsulated what's called Chentsov's theorem. So, uh, in probability distribution, uh, in, prob in, in information theory and in, in the theory of probability, a natural thing is a stochastic map. Stochastic maps are linear maps between probability spaces, right? So you have a probability distribution, and uh, there is a, a, a secondary uh, sort of um, a histogram or sampling that you 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 take. Uh, the the initial sort of uh, probability distribution goes through a stochastic matrix. Then intuitively, uh, you know the, the the entropy increases. The, the, the data is sort of more fuzzy, and you lose information. So, um, so the distribution after it's acted upon by a stochastic map would be much more difficult to distribution, more difficult to discriminate between one another. They should get closer. So it makes sense to to ask for, you know, what metrics make stochastic maps contractive? Because things be get closer. If I have a picture of one person and then I add a lot of noise to it, you know, I couldn't be able to discriminate between two people. So the distance between fuzzy pictures should be closer. Stochastic map has to be contractive, and Chenzo's theorem says that under the Fisher metric, uh, uh, sorry, the, the stochastic maps are contractive under the Fisher metric, and the Fisher metric is the unique metric that's Riemannian and has this property. So the question is for power spectral density. We would like to add a little bit uh, more of a wish list in metrics. And we, we, we can approach this from a different angle. And this connects to a, another subject, to optimal transport. And somehow, uh, there are a lot of links between all these subjects. And it will become clear shortly. Um, so we would like, really, a metric that uh, it behaves naturally under uh, additive noise, possibly multiplicative noise, and also has some um, 
uh, it's weakly continuous. In other words, you have continuity of moments. Small changes do not vary the moments very much. Uh, so again, the same wish list a little bit more precisely. You would like a metric which, if you add noise to the two power spectra, you get uh, a little bit less of a distance. And the same when you add you introduce multiplicative noise. And you need also continuity of moments. Now it turns out that the previous thing, on, on for reasons that um, are easy to, to understand if you start thinking about deterministic processes, the, the metric built on, on the problem of prediction is not working so well. It doesn't have these properties. So um, there is a very natural uh, distance between distributions, which is, is sort of um, comes hand in hand when you're talking about weak continuity. A and I'll give you a little bit of an introduction on this, which will tie in, in in various ways also with the Fisher information metric. So we turn a little bit to a different page. So the, the, um, this is uh, a, a problem called optimal mass transport. It was introduced by Gaspar Monch in 1871. He was interested in digging uh, and moving earth so that he makes sort of flat roads. He worked in Napoleon's army. He's very famous for a number of things, including descriptive geometry. He was the father of descriptive. He was one of the, the people that uh, uh, founded uh, called Polytechnique. I mean, there's a lot of, right? And, and Kantorovich, Kantorovich is the, uh, the father of linear programming, which he uh, actually invented as exactly to solve this kind of problems for allocation of resources. So it's a long story. This problem becomes very, very important in recent years by contributions by a number of people, Brenier, Villani, Mac, uh, Otto, and so forth. Um, and it's, it's, it's very important in physics. How do you move mass from here to there uh, with uh, you know, paying uh, as least uh, as possible, uh, you know, incurring as least as possible the cost. So there is a cost um, which tells you that, you know, you take the mass that you move from point A to point B, and the cost has to do with the distance between the point A and the point B. Phi tells you where you moved every pebble. So the, 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 the masses have to be equal. Uh, and to construct such a map is, is the task. Uh, the original problem is nonlinear, and Kantorovich uh, reformulated in such a way so that it's a ba basically linear programming problem. So there is there's a lot that is known about this problem. And uh, roughly, um, here for the one-dimensional distributions, uh, mu0 and mu1, you can compute the distance between them, the transportation distance. And this is called the Wasserstein distance. Uh, it turns out, so it's the infimum over, oh, I have over here s. I should have been phi. Sorry for that. So you move uh, mass from point omega to phi omega. And this is how much mass you move. This is the cost you incurred. And the minimum of the transportation plants is, is the cost. Here is one distribution, here is the other, and here's the transportation plan. So a pebble from this spot is going to go here, and so forth. So, um, so that's, that's the, the, the transportation distance. These are masses. These are power spectral densities. Shortly, we'll move into that. And P denotes probability distributions. In some ways, there's a close relationship between all this. Uh, you can easily construct geodesics. Uh, I, I, geodesics tell you, like, if you decide on the transportation plan and, and every pebble starts moving from the initial position to the final position, think of this as a point, is, is a distribution of rubble, some sand, and it moves to this. They all live on the same space. So this is you know, more like blowing up. You have the cross product of the two spaces. And, gives you a transportation plan. So strictly speaking, a pebble from here, if it is supposed to go, let's say, from point 1 and it's supposed to go to point 2, you can picture the pebble moving slowly from point 1 to point 2. And the whole distribution deforms. So here is sort of the beginning distribution, the red, the, sorry, the blue, and then the red, and the green is sort of in between. 
So the whole mass starts shifting. I, had, I have a video for this, but it, it's, it's problematic to embed video in LaTeX, so I, I, I skip that. Now, there is a problem, though, that if we want to, and, and it's a very natural metric because it's weakly continuous. Okay? Weakly continuous means that, you see, if you, if you have uh, two, two uh, distributions, one is concentrated here and one is concentrated there, anything that you do that has to do with subtracting them, logarithmically comparing them point-wise, will not be sensitive to the fact that one distribution is concentrated here and one is there as opposed to one, you know, being closer to one another. It doesn't care about the relative distance, whether transportation does. So what is a natural way to shift, uh, to use this in the context of power spectra when the masses are not equal? So here is one possibility, there are others. Um, you can view uh, the, the two power spectra as noisy measurements of, um, of um, uh, some true power spectrum sitting behind. A and uh, the total variation between two distributions can be given this, this, this uh, expression. It's the minimum of uh, perturbations in the two that will equalize them. That's the total variation. So. A, a, a proposition that does make sense is when you try to compare two power spectra, you perturb each of the two ends so that you equalize the, the energy and, and use optimal transport between the two. So physically, this makes sense. Uh, and it does uh, give a number of, of properties that one would like. So this kind of a metric it gives actually a metric and satisfies all of the, the, the uh, elements in the wish list. Okay? So now, so uh, this kind of uh, closes a little bit the, you know, the, uh, so the, the sequence of, of models that we have in terms of metrics and their qualities. So this, uh, the, the prediction based is, is only based on, on performance degradation. Uh, the one that I just talked about with transportation respects certain natural, um, natural properties, natural transformations in, this, in the, the type of objects that you're dealing with. The information based somehow has both properties together. Uh, I will, let me see, the, I have to, uh, until 12 o'clock, right? Yeah. OK. So let me go very quickly through some applications, just to spark a little bit your kind of the imagination of what you can do with this, with a metric. And then I'll return a little bit to optimal transport, uh, draw a little bit of connections between all three subjects. It's a very ambitious plan. And then the last part is about multivariable generalizations, which is absolutely pretty, but it's, it's ongoing. Let, let me just ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, so in the, uh, in the MK transport, you don't necessarily preserve the shape, right? You just preserve the mass. You preserve the mass. Let me go back to this. So, so that the idea is to use optimal transport, which has a significance. You're moving power from one frequency right. to another. Okay. And, and tie up the two ends with a total variation distance to an intermediate, a set of intermediate objects. So allow a little bit of adjustment of two ends, because after all, the spectrum is computed based on data. Right, and, and there is variability and so on. And actually, this is, this is a slight modification of optimal transport. It's not that complicated. And, and computing distances becomes a, 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 a convex optimization problem. Numerically, it's not as simple as before. You don't have closed form expressions. But it's doable. So 
any of this can be applied in a variety of, of settings. For example, uh, a very simple problem uh, of tying measurements together. In the context of, of uh, data points, we all some, at some point made a living with the squares. You have you know, dots, and you fit a line through that, going all the way to Gauss, where you try to right, uh, fit geodesics to the, the position of the asteroid Ceres, and so forth. You know, least squares made perfect sense. Now, at times, you have partial data of something evolving, and you like to tie those together. And typically, we devise parametric models, and we find the parameters. But sometimes we have parametric models as, as just an assumption. So here I, I have a little example of a, a chirp signal. Here you see the frequency shifting from one end to the other. If you hear this, this is in, in a lot of noise. Here is the actual time series. Uh, if you hear it, it just looks like a, like a plane going overhead. And you'd like to identify sort of this, this harmonic as it's sort of moving along uh, from very, very short observation records. The observation records are this small. These are the blue things. Nothing else is observed. If you do a, a Fourier uh, you know, a periodogram, you get something like this. And here you get something like this. And here you get from this data, you get something like this, and so forth. So these four periodograms are your points of reference. These are like the five points that you have on this graph. And then you want to fit a geodesic through them. A geodesic in the metric. When you do that, everything will be corrected. Because the geodesic has a certain shape that ties all of them together. And the improvement is here. Like the geodesic will give you this corrected spectra in the place of the periodograms. So in summary, you get, let's say, samples from short observation records of, of the power spectrum that as it sort of uh, shifts. These are slowly time varying processes. And you like to determine a geodesic. The geodesic has a specific form, which is closed form in one case. But also in the other case with transportation, you get very similar results. So that the distance in the metric of this, the, sample point, the samples of the geodesic to the estimated power spectra is, is smaller. And then you get, you know, you have the beginning and the end, and you get geodesics in the middle. When you use the predictive error variance uh, type of metric, you get a slightly fade in, fade out effect. But the logarithm mediates that. When you use uh, transportation metrics, then that's all uh, removed. So again, the difficulty in computing those uh, is, is for OMT, is more significant. But it still, still is manageable. So what you're saying is basically, uh, if, if you respect the space where your, your signals live in, that's right. By by attributing it the, its proper uh, it's metric, proper metric, then you do much better. You do much better. Okay. Yes, that's the point. The metric has to do with what you want to do with that. And, if you, and, and the, the thesis here is that you decide what you want the metric for. You don't open a book and get a metric and use that. And sometimes you can develop a metric specifically for the task at hand. Uh, here, are, I'll go very quickly through that. Uh, here, this is um, you know, some frequency noise. And this is the, the, the power spectrum, this and that. And of course, you would like a metric that this distance, is, this distance is smaller than this distance and smaller than that distance. And um, you can see that the transportation shows the respective distances correctly. The uh, prediction, because these are deterministic processes, is blind to that. That's, that's a deficiency, because you can get do op we can talk about this quite a lot, but it's blind to that. The Takura cycle gives them completely the wrong way. So uh, we have played with phoneme separation. I will skip this. Here is, again, a very similar thing. This is the, the, the phoneme A by female, male, and male. 
and you would expect certain things. You would expect that the the green and the red would be closer and the blue would be further apart. Here all three work the same. So it depends on the application. It's not made for that, but it, it works fine. So the prediction, transportation, Takura side, they all work the same. You can use metrics to do morphing. So this is speech signal, and we have some, some experimentation. It's not always perfect, because this is not what we do. This is just an application. You have a speech signal from a person, uh, and the same thing, the same voice from another person. And you can use geodesic to create morphing on one speech to another. So for example, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to play this, but I have uh, sentences like, thank you for your attention, which um, is spoken by two people, my female student and myself. And then we morph this, and it looks something like a little bit more more um, um, sort of artificial, but not that much. So it creates a new, uh, we played with things like that. And, and there are pluses and minuses, and we're still playing. Now, this is something that I, I toyed with with uh, Alan Tannenbaum. Um, and he had some work on very similar things before. And this is a transition to some uh, more higher dimensional data. When you have an image, you draw an outline. You want to outline, you, you detect the edge. So usually you use an edge detection, and you just have the computer draw this edge. An alternative way is, is to uh, draw any odd uh, figure automatically or semi-automatically around the object, and then have the, the, the uh, image move in the gradient, in some sort of gradient descent to hug the object in such a way so that it maximizes the distance between some statistical features inside and outside. So if you have any distribution, for example, here the outside looks like noise, the inside has some regularity pattern, you can, you can take a histogram from inside or, or some, some power spectral in two dimensions kind of setting, and then you try to deform it. And here, you s y this, this schematic shows you the statistics sort of inside, when you, you have highlighted this very carefully in the statistics outside, some histogram. And this shows sort of how the distance between the two increases as the, the figure starts getting closer. I have a, a video for this, but I will leave it to your imagination, because I have a lot more to say. <laughs> now. This is a, the, the next two slides are very busy. And we have to sort of skip the details. This is a really beautiful chapter, which started about 10, 12 years ago by Ben Amouen Brignier, and kind of ties a number of things together. Okay? In the optimal mass transport between two distributions was recast by these two fellows in this way. And this is absolutely beautiful. So let me say just a little bit um, of what it means. You have a mass distribution and moves to another one. The optimal mass transport is going to basically take pebbles and start moving them in some final, towards some final position with a velocity. And, and, and the path is, is straight, because if you go in circles, you can only increase the cost of transportation. So there's going to be a velocity at every point as you move the mass from initial position to the final. There is a velocity field. There's a velocity field that takes everything in the proper direction. So um, it turns out that the Bashestein distance can be recast in this way. What is this way? This way says that you have a, 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 some pebble. That's the mass of a pebble. And that is the square of the velocity instantaneously when the pebble is at x. So this thing here is kinetic energy. The integral over the whole space is kinetic energy. And when you integrate from beginning distribution to the final is action, the action integral. In physics, everything is you know, action integral. The moment you know about the action integral, you're done. And uh, this is absolutely beautiful. And it has an extra 
uh, dimension to this, which was not known before. And this dimension is the following. Uh, you will see a tiny bit in the next, uh, next uh, slide as well. So what happens is, think of mu uh, being a distribution, mass distribution, as the space, let's say, D. So these are positive things that add to one, probability distributions, if you like. The tangent space of this is perturbations which integrate to 0. Right. So what happens is this thing here, sort of in the small, when there is a small perturbation from beginning to the end, induces a Riemannian metric. So I'll just, uh, there, there is a correspondence between perturbations from mu, in other words, points in the tangent space here, and the vector fields that move you in the optimal direction. That, that's a little bit technical and goes through some Poisson equation and so forth. But roughly, you can guess this thing from here. This is basically almost re can be replaced by some uh, transformation of the delta. So there, there is a correspondence between V and delta. So you can define actually a Riemannian structure. Uh, a Riemannian structure, so the, the perturbations from some nominal m at the position, sorry, mu, at the position mu can be written like this. And there is some relationship with that which is a little bit technical. So you say, well, so, so what? The optimal transport problem has somehow inherently in it a Riemannian metric. Now, there is a beautiful connection with Fisher information. Uh, if you take the, the entropy functional to quantify distance from, let's say, flatness or whatever, and you look at the gradient descent, you, you see which direction um, uh, the, the s decreases the fastest. The, the ds dt in that metric becomes the Fisher information. And the, the, f the, the, the change in the point mu, mu the distribution is a point in a space that uh, affects this in the, in, in the s sort of the steepest descent is actually the heat equation. So it's, it's a very, very beautiful connection. Optimal transport, uh, Fisher information, the heat equation, you have everything on the table. Okay? And um, the next slide has a little bit of more general things, what you can do with this, and some connections, and then we'll... we'll um, so uh, there is something called the affine invariant heat equation that can be also cast in the same setting. I'm, I'm going to go th very, very fast through this because... Uh, and and you, can, you can show that a number of things, a number of natural uh, PDEs, can be written as, as gradient flows of suitable functionals. So here you have the mu, you, you have a functional on this mu, and you look at gradient descent and you end up with uh, ds dt is gradient flow. In fact, you can play a lot with this, and if f is a logarithm, you get, you get over here the negative of the prediction-based metric, right? In the previous slide, let me just go back, here, effectively, you have the, well, you have the Fisher metric. And the Fisher metric is effectively delta square over mu. When you play this out, is delta square over mu. If you use the logarithm, then you get uh, the same expression. But over here, you get integral of delta square over f over mu square. So you get the prediction-based metric. So this thing is, is a very general way of, of um, uh, seeking um, uh, natural directions for which um, certain functionals decrease and, and, um, and, and get different insights. Again, this c all can, has not played out completely. So and then. Uh, the, the only th uh, point here is to, to give a justification that this was gradient flow. So let me move. I have 10 more minutes. 
Let's take a little bit of a break, just deep breath. And I would like to put on the table this, this question of how you do things for matrix-valued objects. Everything, like optimal prediction, if you have matrix-valued probability, density functions like quantum mechanics, optimal transport. What is the story there? So it turns out that there is a very, very rich um, a set of mathematical ideas and connections. Again, this is all being developed. Some of it uh, I hope I'll be able to give you the gist of. And it connects with uh, work that has been going on for a while or is, is taking place right now, uh, driven initially by geometry of quantum mechanics. Uh, there is work on Riemannian geometry of positive definite matrices. This has been connected to information geometry. We can connect it also to Zigo Kolmogorov. And there are some versions that relate to uh, uh, Monge Kantorovich's optimal transport. So some of those connections are there, some of them so we're doing. And at the end, I would like to, to finish with an example that shows you how in, in multivariable spectral analysis, you do get a very, very significant uh, and very useful tool. Okay. <coughs> so briefly, from kullback liebler to Fischer-Rao, if you have two Gaussian distributions, and f I use f here for a covariance to, rem to remind us the, p the, the power spectral density. So f0 and f1 are covariances. So if you have um, perturbation of those covariances, uh, and you look at the kullback liebler distance between the PDFs, you end up with the, uh, the Fischer-Rao metric, which looks like this. It's the Frobenius norm of phi minus a half delta phi minus a half. This is very much like the prediction metric that we had before. Because what is this? This is delta square over f square. It's not delta square over f, like the Fischer metric. This is delta square over f square. There are two halves, and there is a square there. So there is. Uh, now, <coughs> a, the, the, um, when you look at positive definite matrices with that metric, you can construct uh, geodesic distances and geodesics, which are very reminiscent to what we had before. But now you have to have the exponent suitably introduced. So this looks like f1 over f0 to the power t. This generalizes the previous thing. What's, the, what's t? Uh, tau. Tau. Yeah, what is tau is, is the uh, a, a value between 0 and 1. We're doing Physically, what is that? It, it's, when we're trying to construct geodesics, we are looking for a path. Uh, let me see. What do I, what do I write right. here? Do, do I write like this? Yeah. No, oh. not that oh, one. No. On the, yeah. There is another pen there. There should be another pen there. Uh, what is that? Can uh, you just write right on the screen? I can write right here. Yeah. Yeah. Can I write here? Yeah. So, so. Mm. I don't no. think you can. I don't think I can. No, you have two points, mm -hmm. the point zero and the point one. Right. And you construct a geodesic. Right. The index of the geodesic path is tau from zero to one. Okay. All right. So f sub tau moves from zero to one. So this is the expression for the geodesic, and tau belongs to the interval 0, 1. Okay. So when tau is 0, you get f0. When tau is 1, then those things cancel, and you get f1. And in between, it's actually the path that you're moving. All right. <coughs> and this has a no no number of nice properties. Uh, you can play more or less the same thing that we had before. You can look at one step ahead prediction. You, these are multivariable time series. You can put in, um, you need to, to weigh things accordingly. So you take multivariable power spectral densities, you do the spectral factorization, and then you need to weigh in things accordingly so that um, it's some sort of a normalization that helps the computation. So the, this is the only difference that there is there from before. 
And again, you can define devise uh, multivariable versions of the metrics that we had before, geodesics, and the whole lot. And, and here, the only difference is that the metric is the delta uh, divided on both sides by the, the spectral factor squared, and then you have a trace. So uh, you can do, um, uh, again, <coughs> I, I'll probably should skip through that. Again, if you look at sort of innovations process, when you design the, the prediction coefficients based on one power spectrum and apply to the other, these are all matrices now. This is a vector, vector valued process. And these are matrices. Then you can again define distance and metric, which looks very similar to what we saw before. The, the Fischer-Rau metric. So all of this kind of connect. You can, you can construct geodesics. You have a metric. You have some congruence invariance property. I, I don't want to, uh, to clutter these things with that. But again, you have a downside. You have fade in, fade out, because everything is, is frequency related. Now, um, when you talk about the Fisher information metric, there is a lot of work in, in quantum mechanics of trying to generalize it. In quantum mechanics, instead of a, a probability distribution whose entries sum up to one, you have positive definite matrices whose trace is one. Okay? These are called density matrices. Very much like in probability setting, you can ask the question, what are uh, metrics for which stochastic maps are contractive? There are stochastic maps for density matrices. Namely, you sandwich them suitably from left and right. You can, there are some more generalized general objects. And then in that context, the question stands, what is the natural Riemannian metric for which stochastic maps are contractive? In this setting, you have the Fisher metric. In this setting, you have a whole family of Fisher metrics, where you have the delta squared. And here is division by m. But the division is a non-commutative division, and there are many ways you can do that. So think of the m dividing the m. It could be just m inverse, or it could be some other ways that you can define to make it commutative. So there is a whole family. There's a zoo of Fisher information metrics. And um, there is generalization of a number of things that we are quite familiar in the context of, um, of probability theory. So let me uh, skip very quickly and say that uh, we have also generalizations of the optimal mass transport where you basically turn the, uh, the, 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 the mass, which is now a met matrix object, and, and it, it connects to something called the, the uh, Boer's metric. I, I, I have to go through this very quickly, because I want to um, show you some pictures. So um, pictures are good. Huh? Pictures are good. Pictures are good, <laughs> yes. So let me, let, me go, let me skip to this. So what, what I'm, my, my point here is that a lot of these geometric objects generalize to matrices, and you can have a, a, um, a non-commutative version of the optimal mass transport. Le let me st stay here just for a tiny bit. Okay, You have two matrices. These are positive definite matrices, trace one, for example. In the context of, of quantum mechanics, these are, these, are called, these are thought as density matrices of two subsystems. And um, you can think of a density matrix on the tensor product space, which is something much bigger. The optimal mass transport in this context becomes minimize the trace of a cost functional multiplying m. m is going to be the optimal transport plan. And the partial trace in the direction of a is 1. And the partial trace in the direction of other is this. This is very much like the picture I had before, where uh, along one direction you have one probability density. On, along the other, you have another probability density. And you have the optimal mass transport between the two. A, a, a reformulation which allows you to, to penalize rotations brings us in, uh, um, can, be, can be done in this way in analogy with previous formulas, 
where you have the cost, this is capital C, sorry for this, and you have a penalty on how much you rotate the, the, the eigenvectors. So this is almost like, again, I don't have time to explain it, it's almost like a, 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 a um, kinetic energy. And you can, you can write this, it's, it's quite natural, and it becomes a convex optimization problem. So let me give you now pictures, two pictures, and then I will be done. <coughs> so this thing here is a very, very simple uh, experiment. You have two microphones, right? And, um, um, and you have a source for noise that's moving down. It's like a train going. And um, so you're recording here white noise plus some sinusoid. And because of the Doppler shift, you, you see uh, you know, this, this, uh, some lines changing. And it's not only changing, it's shifting. The energy is shifting from one channel to the other. So if you have this vectorial time series, uh, the power spectral density is a 2 by 2 object. And then you see it here. So this is the 1, 1 entry, the power spectrum of this. This is the power spectrum of that. And this is the cross spectrum. The cross spectrum here is the amplitude, and here's the phase. Those things are real, so there is no phase. So this is the. So you see the same picture here, here, and in, in the following picture. And you can see here, for example, that sort of energy is shifting from one channel to the other. So there is some rotation taking place. This is the phase, which is all complicated. So and, and um, here is, is sort of a rendering of, of how the corresponding uh, direction moves in space. So this is if you use some um, uh, sort of periodogram or, or maximum entropy sort of method for identifying locally the spectrum and stitching them together. And here is if you try to use geodesics in optimal mass transport. Let me show the same picture for, for two sources. This is more interesting. You have two sources moving like this. And, um, and uh, again, uh, for the here is <coughs> here is an estimate of the, the the joint spectrum, and this thing here you can you can pictorially, as we will see in the, in the final picture that I will show you, uh, a <coughs> represented in three D as two vectors, sort of moving, each corresponding one of the source. The picture on the right is OMT path. Optimal mass transport is more or less like a regularization of this, which is non-parametric. So you, sh you move those things together, right? And you construct, you construct the path in, 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 you know, of the eigenvectors. So this is the picture that you get by brute force stitching together the power spectra. And this is the regularization that the optimal mass transport gives you. So it's clear you can, you can do much, much better detection. So the more complicated, the more benefit you get. Uh, of course, it comes at a cost. So with this, I would like to recap and say that geometry is important, gives you a number of tools. Um, and you'd like to develop it in a, mod in a way that is, is uh, it's suitable to your problem. Um, we have some examples here which lead to computation tractable solutions to, to different type of, of standard problems, registration, tracking, deformations, and so forth. And this whole sort of project is some sort of a, a plan to develop you know, a new set of tools for, for uh, sensing and, and technology of this type. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So I went a couple of minutes over time. We have time for a very quick question. Yeah, a very quick question. Sure. Yeah. So for the probability uh, metric, is just for probability mass function or for, is it for probability mass function or for probability distribution? Or in other words, is discrete or is You continuous? can have continuous versions of that. Okay. Yeah, continuous meaning the, the uh, indexing. Yeah. Actually, this is very interesting. Maybe we can talk uh, later. Because uh, 
former student of mine, uh, myself, actually have developed the sort of generalizations of these uh, uh, back mm -hmm. distances for an arbitrary number of densities. I see. So, okay. uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, I wonder what... what they they, they what, are what also, you know, motivable in Takura Saito, and there are connections. Yeah, I, I, there I are a lot of connections to all these objects. Yeah, I'm not sure how it fits in this thing. Yeah. 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 All right, let's uh, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to pick you up right after the...